Stephen Borges with S&J Associates, and I'm back here in Stockton, California, here at Teal Pepe's, very good restaurant in my head, great coffee, and uh, good food. But also, today, I'm here with a uh, candidate for the United States Congress of the 9th District, Tom Patty. Tom, welcome to the show. Appreciate Stephen, it. Stephen, thank you, but also county supervisor. Currently, I am, a, I am not a politician, I'm a public servant. Thank you for correcting me. Just, just added bonus. Thank you. Good to see you in J-Man Jack. It's so good to be with you guys again. I appreciate constantly being that voice in the community, asking questions, being present, and engaging. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that, sir. Thank you. Uh, since you're the chairman of the County Board of Supervisors, and, and again, thank you for taking your time. I know you're busy. I know you're out We're there. All busy, You're very, very We're busy. All busy. I really appreciate you doing this for S and J. Appreciate it. Thank you. All good. Thank you. Four questions, and okay. four questions only. First question for you, Tom. The homeless, it's a huge issue. It's all over the United States. Uh, it's on people's minds. They see it every day, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. So my question to you, sir, is you're running for the United States Congress, 9th District. What can you do as a United States Congressman? What can you do about the homeless? That's a great question, Stephen. Um, first and foremost, and I've had my fingers on the pulse of this because it's pre prevalent in our community and throughout this county. Um, I'm very proud that I was able to, last year, with another supervisor, Robert Rickman from Tracy, 5th District, I was able to collaborate with him. Okay. He pushed through, brought to the, 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 the agenda for the board, I'm thoroughly convinced that my name alone was on that, even though I initiated and negotiated with the cities and talked about their emergency shelter ideas. Okay. I took that initiative. I included Supervisor Rickman. Had my name been on it, it probably wouldn't have got approved because there's two supervisors that see things different. So we needed three-fifths, and I'm sorry, we needed four-fifths to allocate any type of funding, and I'm proud that that got passed through with Supervisor Robert Rickman's participation. Um, I'm very disappointed that three out of five approved the bigger plan in partnership with the city of Stockton, in partnership with St. Mary's, in partnership with what would have ideally been a campus of service. And that was negated and shot down. And you could say there's justifiable reasons. I'm, I can't, listen, not everybody's going to agree with everything. And I can tell you, Stephen, if you had ten people in the room right now and you asked them about homelessness, you'll have ten different ideas. You got to do tiny village. You have to do tent city. You have to do, and you, know, you have to do shipping containers. You have to do. There's all sorts of pathways there, and I can say effectively that they're all great ideas. But what can we do that's most cost effective? And if you look at what's the military do when they go set up, they put up a barracks, bunk beds, and services, so that you are self-sufficient and you're contained and you're utilizing your assets. So, what we first must recognize is obviously the necessity. Second, we must recognize that the housing first approach is an abject failure. It has come down to and become a cottage industry. It is a waste of government dollars. Once you build that in California, four hundred and fifty to eight hundred ninety thousand dollar single apartment, which is astronomical in cost, times multiply that with one hundred and sixty thousand homeless people, you will never house your way out of this. Okay. So understand that the housing first approach is an abject failure. So now we must capitulate. The first thing, declare a national emergency on homelessness. We must declare a national emergency on homelessness. People are struggling. It's a crisis of humanitarian proportion. This is not a stray animal. And if it was a stray animal, we would stop. We would bring that animal inside. We would make sure that animal was healthy, we would make sure that animal is safe. I'm talking about a dog or a cat sure. next to a road. We would not leave that stray animal there. How is it possibly, conceivably acceptable that we allow human beings to live out there where there is their own safety issues, they have food insecurity, they have crime, there is theft, there is rape, there is a myriad of horrendous 
experiences happening to these individuals, and this is somebody's brother, somebody's sister, somebody's uncle, somebody's mom. These are, this, these are people in our community that are struggling. Now, if we ask them, would you like to go get services? They may not be in that capacity, psychologically and emotionally, to make a comprehensive decision, a coherent decision that's to the benefit of their well-being. So we must offer an alternate location and bed, and there has to be a carrot and stick approach. We have to bring them in from that disparity, that squalor, that risky environment that they find themselves in, and have individual assessment, wraparound services, and I mean drug treatment, which is massively prevalent. We know that there's behavior health issues. We know that individual assessment can bring forth, and when we have a condensed and a concerted effort at locations, emergency shelters, then we can be more efficient and effective with the resources we have, because there isn't enough providers, there isn't enough people to individually go and do a case manage as people are scattered throughout, you know, miles apart. So, first thing to answer your question, long, you know, short, short answer is declare a national emergency and let's do a paradigm shift on how we're addressing it. It's not a housing issue. When they take that couch surfing homeless person and put them in an, into an apartment and the taxpayer will pay for that apartment for all of eternity. There is no sobriety, no job, uh, job training requirements. There is no levels of accountability in any capacity. The taxpayer has not only paid for this apartment at an exorbitant rate, but now the taxpayer is paying in perpetuity the rent, the, the, all of the utilities, everything that goes with that apartment, which is quite costly. So we must bring people to the point where they're self-sufficient, where they reconnect with their family, where they, where they have that, that safety net, when they have that support. Once they're stable, once they've gotten some medication that they know they need, and then they maybe, when they were on the medication, they stopped self-medicating, or they, they stopped the, the prescribed medication that kept them balanced and, and helped them with their different psychological issues that some people, unfortunately, may have. And they've fallen off of the grid. Let's reconnect them to their support network once they are, and it's not a 28-day program. Once you've got a person stable, then let's reconnect them to that gateway of their support network. Independency, self-sufficiency, being a productive member in society, reconnecting with their family. And you see stories where people say, hey, now I'm with my grandchildren. Now I'm with my, my, my children. They've accepted me back into, into their life, into the family. I, I've noticed that a lot of the three types of homeless, there's the people who just lost their family, they lost their job, sure. and they're off the grid. Then there's the people with mental health issues, and there's people with drug issues, and those, those are usually the three. Yeah. And well, make no mistake, as we've seen the escalation of opioid use, mm -hmm. you see an escalation of homelessness. Uh, uh, and when you talk to officers, you talk to first responders, I've seen statistics of 25, 30, up to 40% are substance abuse issues. Well, I've listened to these first responders who are there on the ground dealing with them and say, Tom, 99% of this is substance abuse. This, wow. is, this is drugs. Very late. Now, some people might have mental health issues and they're self-medicating, uh -huh. or this heavy drug use has caused a lot of the challenges that they're having emotionally or psychologically. So. One way or another, we know we need services mm -hmm. to help stabilize and get a person back to where they're able to, to, to be more responsive, respectful, and, and engage in that process of getting better. Those are, number, those are brand new numbers that I just heard today. Wow. Yeah. Now, and I'm going on what I'm told. I'm, yeah, not, oh, I'm yeah. not the okay. field study. Sure. When, when, when consistently, I'm told by law officers and fire, first, uh, our fire department, they're like, 99% of this is drugs. Wherever we go, there's needles. Wherever we go, there's, there's substance abuse issues. Okay. Which brings me to question number two, crime. Crime. What, sure. What, uh, what can we do? I mean, it's, we've had uh, a variety of tragedies, but one of the things that pops in my mind is, is Officer Jimmy N, who lost his life. Uh, Captain Max Fortuna, who lost his life. 
and these were public service people, people serving the community, uh, serving Stockton, serving, you know, California. What can we do about crime? What about the, the, the off-the-hook homicides that are taking place? What, what can we do about this? Well, here's the problem. Here's the problem. In, when a society, and uh, through a ballot initiative, we started to decriminalize crime. So you can go in a store and you can just loot up to X amount of dollars, 900 plus dollars, and there's no, it's just a misdemeanor. And so there's no report, there's no, you just can't even, the store's like, no, don't even stop them because there's nothing we can do. And the corporate has said, don't even bother because we can be sued, okay? So now you start to decriminalize different actions. Um, you've got less of a safety net. Um, and you see a big outcry, and there's some public protest, and there's you know, defund the police movement, and there's narratives about how, how terrible first responders or police might be, when we know that's all factually incorrect. Right? Without that 911 response team that brings out law enforcement or brings out some level of you know, a crisis response team, which I'm 100% in favor of, I've studied it up in Olympia, Washington, so that when it's not perhaps a crime, but it might be a behavior health issue, it might be some other crisis in a person's life at the moment where there's no crime to be committed, there's no weapons to be disarmed, you have a crisis response team that comes out. It's a tag team approach. Fantastic. That's more likely what people intend. Instead of defund the police, let's actually enhance the police response toolbox so they have a crew, a crisis response unit. All right, it's worked very effectively up in Olympia, up in Eugene, Oregon, all these different places that it has worked effectively. So you know, we need to have levels of accountability. We need to have a civil society, and we need to have fair, equitable justice for all. All right, I'm 100% in favor of that. We also see an escalation in drug use. You're also seeing more theft and robberies, small theft. You talk to every business up and down and throughout certain areas where there's a lot of homeless encampments. Like, I can't keep car batteries. I can't keep this. They come in they, in the middle of the night. They steal things to just go get a few dollars for another fix of drugs. They are desperately out there looking for money to get their nightly fix. So tragic as it is, you know, that's why I you know, firmly believe you know, we need wraparound approach and services. You have to triage. If you've got one person that's got a, you know, a massive artery that's you know, bleeding and hemorrhaging a lot of blood, and that person will be dead within minutes, mm -hmm. and you have another person that has a paper cut, where do you go? you got to go right to the person and do a tourniquet, and you got to take care of that person that's hemorrhaging, because that is a critical crisis that's unfolding in real time. We can get to this person in a moment, but we're going to take care of what's critical, and that's what we need to address, what's critical. And you know, it's not just heavy-handed enforcement. I firmly believe, you want a better economy? You want less crime? Give a person a job. Where's, our, where's the enhancement and the focus and the maximum potential that we can implement for job training? Since vocational opportunities have been taken out of high school and they're trying to reintroduce them and they're behind the curve 30 years, we've got, I've got friends of mine as a business owner, I've got people I know, contractors I've worked with, they're like, Tom, there is no next generation. I'm hiring people that are 50 plus when I should be hiring people that are 20 plus in the HVAC business. In the, in the, I mean, they're all looking for the trades, right? Sure. <clears throat> so we need to increase and maximize that vocational experience and opportunity through great programs like MC3 that could be introduced in the high school to show you trades and pathways to earning a good living without having to go into debt going to college. You go to college, get a, get a, get a bachelor's degree, and you can earn an average of $50,000 a year, and you can have forty dollars to $80,000 in debt. Or you can become a, a certified welder and make ninety dollars to $120,000, and by the time you're 25 years old without debt, own your first, first home. Right. I mean, these things are all possible, but children are not, our youth are not exposed to that opportunity. And so I firmly believe you want to reduce the crime, jobs, job training, job training. vocational training. training. Let's yeah. show them a training. pathway to training. forward. Trades. trades. And that's coming from a tradesman. I, <laughs> I'm a welder. I'm a crane operator. I'm a sign man. I've, I can fix electrical signs. I've installed them. I've manufactured them. I grew up since eight years old on uh, working side by side with my dad, who was a self-made tradesman. Wow. Yeah, my father would same thing as an x-ray tech, and I went through the same thing as an EMT. 
Yeah. Trade school. Yeah. Abrams College. Yeah. And you always have that. No matter if the drug is pulled out, you can shift to go, I have trade. I will always be a crane operator. I can always service yeah. sign. I can always manufacture. I can always operate my tools. Yeah. And, uh, and and one of them uh, with, with a girlfriend that I've been seeing, and and she's like, "Yo, how do you know all this stuff?" I'm like, "Since I'm a little kid, right? I've worked with my hands side by side with my dad, who was a master tradesman. And um, I'm 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 a jack of all trades. I can fix or break." <laughs> anything. Sometimes the picture might be a little crooked or off center, but it's up there. It looks pretty darn good. <laughs> okay, my uh, third question, of course. Um, we, talk, we touched about it already: public safety and drugs. You know, what can we? How do we nip this in the butt? How, how can we, at the very least, slow it down or, if possible, stop it? You know, Stephen, just about two months ago. I was in Los Angeles with two people that have found God, redemption. Michael, one of them was Michael Franzese, and the other is Mike Tyson, my longtime former stable mate. We grew up since the teenagers boxing, living and training together. And we did a podcast. And in that room, and the podcast is what it is. It was wonderful, good conversation. It was two kids from Brooklyn talking, and I was like, go. I was the adult in the room. <laughs> um, so it, it was great. And I, I consider them both uh, you know, very special people. And, and they've had a journey in their life. Sure. They've found redemption, they've found validation, they've found purpose, and they found God. Yeah. They've found um, yeah. many, a, a new pathway, a better way in life. And I believe in redemption. I believe in, in giving people a second chance. And a second or third, and a fourth chance if, if need be, right? There, it's not above me or anybody else to give a person, hey, come on in. Yeah. We can do better together, okay? So reason why I say that is in the room was a 19-year-old boy, young man, Handsome guy. And it was Mr. Uh, Michael Franzese's daughter's boyfriend. 24 hours later, he was dead. Smoked a little bit of marijuana laced with, unbeknownst to him, some fentanyl, and he died. So we have what is now a crisis. On average, about 100,000 people a year. And if you went over the last 10, 15 years, you had 8, 10, 12, 20, you know, something thousand people a year. Now we have, on average, over 300 people a day dying from fentanyl and opioid overdose. That's a crisis, 100,000 a year. So apparently, from what, my, from what I've read, it's manufactured in China, shipped into Mexico, and carried across the border. By whom, I don't know. How, I don't know. But I know that over the last year plus, it's increased. They, they estimate they, they capture about 10%, and that capture rate is up 132%. I'm told, I'm not an expert, that there's enough fentanyl in America to kill every American seven times. It's so potent. And so our teenagers, our kids, and by the way, the number one cause of death from 18 to 45 right now, fentanyl overdose. Number one cause of death. These are our future fathers. These are our future baseball coaches. These are our future you know, co-workers. These are our future, our future. Our future. They're just gone. Well, we just saw spring break. Two, six people died. They had some fentanyl laced cocaine. Obviously, experimenting with and recreated with, with, with recreational drugs is not okay. I'm not, I don't do drugs at all. I don't support them. And so there was two West Point graduates. Now here's you're on you're on the pathway to success, man. Right. You're a West Point grad. You put that on your resume. You're a Fortune 500 hire in a second. Right. Gone. Dead. They'll never walk. They'll never talk. They'll never laugh. They'll never enjoy family. They'll never experience the benefits of this great, amazing, diverse, and phenomenally opportunistic country that we live in. We have the privilege to be in. They'll never have that experience again. So we have a crisis because what happens is your local neighborhood drug dealer is lacing this stuff. He's not a chemist. And... If he miscalculates, you die. He wants a customer. He wants you to say, whoa, that's so good, I want more. That's what that's all about. And if you're not a chemist, if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to be killing people. And we have that many people dying. So we need, I believe, to look at that as, again, triage. What is going on? How do we stop how do we halt? How do we put, look at our border. When you see re, you know, repetitive reports, documented reports of human trafficking coming across our border, mm. and I'm a father of a daughter. I, I've heard 
recordings from the DA's office and police recordings of young girls that are crying for their mom as they're about to be rescued by the police. Devastating conversations. So, of, of, of rescue. And so having, being a father, being a concerned citizen, being a public servant, our number one job is public safety and public health. There's nothing more important than that. So what are we doing if this is apparent? This is here. This is now. Again, look at it as a crisis and address it. We have resources. We have very smart people. We, have, we can mobilize assets to stop and secure and, and reduce to pay, perhaps a nominal threat, which you know, any threat, any risk is, is you know, that's somebody's son, somebody's daughter, that's somebody's child that's dying in 18 to 45. They're leaving behind a, 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 a wake of disaster. So, so in, in your opinion, there's, there are smart people, resources out sure. there that can give people a second chance, an opportunity. Absolutely. And, and we just have to address it. Well, and, and to that point, okay, when we talk about, you know, levels of accountability for crime and such, and I am, I look at, I look at models of success. In Texas, instead of spending tens of hundreds of millions of dollars expanding for uh, more jails, what they did instead is invest in programs for the inmates. And from anger management and behavior health services and trade schools, they ended up shutting down prisons. Not because they let people out, but because the prisoners reached benchmarks and the recidivism rate was so low. So if we want criminal justice reform, if we want to help another person for redemption and for, for a new pathway in life, and when I talk to probation officers that work in the county, and they say, Tom, I'm on my third and going to, I'm very soon going to be experiencing my fourth generation, grandfather, father, son, and the next child that's in gang, you know, exposed to gang activity. So when you look at, you know, like generational impacts and people that are in and out of jail and courts and, and, uh, and, and on probation, you start to look, we can break that cycle. And how do we break that cycle? Let's, again, let's focus on a different pathway for them. Number four, last question. The economy. Gas prices are going up. Food's going up, everything's going up, everything's expensive. Uh, what can we do about this? There was a really wonderful article in the Washington Post just a few days ago that talked about everything from lowering healthcare costs, um, boosting the supply chain, um, reducing a monopoly on, on the uh, logistics. There's only just a couple of shipping companies. There's only a couple, you know, um, th there's a monopoly on, on the you know, meat packing. Okay. There's a monopoly, and so instead of maybe localizing or, or, or decentralizing it so that there's more competition, there's more resources that people, because there's more enterprise that can enter, you could start to reduce some prices. These are just different suggestions that were thrown in this article. Wonderful. Yeah. Twelve different economists gave opinions of what would make a difference. So lowering health care costs was one of them, but really what I believe in is if you look back, going back a couple of decades now, we were the top chip manufacturer in the world. And now we are not. So those jobs went away. What can we do to bring them back? How can we, how can we increase? So we've got here in San Joaquin County, we've got a area of land that is considered the most desirable industrial land in all of Northern California. East of San Francisco, which has no more industrial land. So we have opportunity for expansion. We have Tesla. We have Kraft Heinz. Those are two projects that were stuck in Sacramento with a bureaucracy of a multitude of agencies finger pointing and putting up brick walls of reasons why you couldn't do what you were going to do, where they were going to do it. And myself and others engaged and we worked through the process and instead of leaving, we kept those jobs here. Right. And so I'm proud of that. So we have industrial land. We have resources. We have the viable and desirable transit corridor. We've got a port, two interstate cities. We've got rail, uh, two, I'm sorry, two interstate highways, and we've got rail. 
and an airport. And an airport. That's expanding and, and being Rolling. utilized by Amazon and others. So we are very well positioned and I'd like us to put together and enhance what I'm proud to say I've already asked, we've already done in San Joaquin County, is, a, um, is an enterprise zone and, and incentive for people to relocate or expand okay. here in San Joaquin County. And it's my understanding that our state assembly member, Carlos Villapudua, apparently I was told yesterday in a meeting that he's got that up in Sacramento. He's looking at accentuating and, you know, and maximizing San Joaquin's potential with what the framework we put forward. And that yeah. was something I asked our um, E2D2 department to come forward with. Okay. They did, and it was their baby, and it was their baby. You know, I just asked them, and they're the bright-minded people that, that put it together. We brought it to the board, and the board approved an incentive program for San Joaquin County. Apparently, it's the only incentive program in the state of California. That gives some tax benefit for companies to relocate here. Uh, I was talking with Bob Gutierrez yesterday. I had a wonderful roundtable discussion with business leaders and, and Mr. Gutierrez from the uh, business partnership. He's like, oh, yeah, no, no, we're, we know about it, and we're using it. We've, we had like, uh, okay, great. I wasn't aware that there's yeah. so much engagement. And he says, no, that uh, Assemblyman Villa Pudua was up in Sacramento with it. So that was great news. That was something that we started here in, in, that, uh, under, under you know, my participation in the county. So I'm very proud of that. Oh, um, so I believe we can get a hold of, but if you really look at your gas prices. You, know, you look at what, what's going on with the supply chain. I am baffled as to how we see what Russia is doing to the Ukraine, and yet our current administration is utilizing Russia to negotiate with Iran who hates us and wants to empirically kill us, as they openly have stated. So we're negotiating with Iran to get their oil resources back on the market. And then we're also using Russia, apparently, to negotiate and work with Venezuela, a communist nation. And we have an oil industry, an energy industry, right here in America that's asking for just open up leases. Open up the financial mechanism that has been shut down on the futures for exploration and for refinery. Let's expand our capacity. I'm told, I'm not an expert, I'm told one of the largest oil, res uh, oil reserves in the world is right here between here and mostly down in uh, Bakersfield area, untapped. I'm told, I'm not an expert, but a couple years ago somebody from one of the oil companies told me is that we have one of the largest oil reserves known in the world right here under our ground. Why aren't we not exploring, exploiting it? If, we, if we've got what is argued and, and established from experts to be hundreds of years of oil reserves, we should be tapping into because the economy is energy. We all love clean water. We love clean air. I've lived in Los Angeles with that you know, haze of smog, and it's, it's not pleasant. And so I understand that. But we also must recognize that we do not forsake our economy. We do not forsake our quality of life for an aggressive agenda that isn't fully sustainable at this point. We don't have enough power on the power grid to, for everybody to have an electric vehicle. We don't have enough battery capacity that, which by the way, we have to get those resources and many of them from foreign nations and a high cost of expenditure of energy to do so. I've taken a tour of Tesla and their, their natural gas burning kills really to, to melt metal and to to build their the the um, the foundries of their motor systems of uh, the electric the motors the car yeah. that's all energy that's not solar that's all natural gas energy that's wonderful do we shut that off right it's like you know we ha we need to there needs to be a partnership of our current resources and when you say when you hear constantly we're going to tax the rich and we're going to constantly take care of the poor. And wonderful, fantastic. Well, if a multimillionaire goes to a gas station to fill up his Ferrari or his, his Lamborghini or his, let's just go with the extravagant and put gas in his yacht. Okay, wonderful, how terrible. Is it really affecting him if he's got you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars? What about that person that's working paycheck to paycheck, that has their right. child care expenses, that has health expenses, right. that's working a couple of jobs. They go to the gas station, and now all jobs, of a sudden, yeah. yeah, exactly. But now all of a sudden, it's costing them, instead of $150 a month, it's costing them $800 a month for gas in their vehicle. That's a, that's a big hit. What do you sacrifice? Well, we're not going to eat now. We're not going to heat the house any longer. What's happening to their quality of life? So let's not be dramatic why, why is the, the, the Keystone Pipeline shut down? 
Because the day that was shut down, gas prices spiked up. Because the futures realized that there's going to be a detrimental impact and the demand was still going to be there, if not increasing, but the supply in the futures was not. And so right away your gas prices jumped up. Right away. Did it, there was no change to the market supply at that moment, but you shut down the futures, the impact goes up. And it shoots up like a rocket and floats down like a feather when it comes to those prices. You mentioned feather. Uh, as a Native American, I lean towards the feathers. So when I hear about the Keystone Pipeline cutting in through a, a, a Native American reservation, right through a, a, a cemetery, a Native American cemetery, I, I take issue with that. Mm -hmm. I take issue with that. And, um, I'm very proud that my people stood up and said, no, you know, go around. That's not a problem. That's, that's an option. But you don't go through a reservation, especially when it's all, all reservations in your, are federal, pro, federal property. Mm -hmm. So by doing any private corporation doing that, taking that course of action, that, they're breaking the law by doing that. And uh, I guess we agree to do, I'm, I'm a big fan for electric cars and, and, and uh, the environment and for the Native Americans. So it's like, uh, we can agree to disagree, but there has to be some type of compromise. You know, the Keystone wants to do a pipe, at least go around the reservation, away from the water, mm -hmm. you know, because that's, water is life. And once you mix oil with water and it doesn't, <laughs> last time I checked in my, my, my chemistry class, it doesn't mi uh, mix. It's, um, it's a hazard. It really is. Um, so, well, but, to the, and to that point, okay. I'm not advocating for breaking law. I'm not advocating. I would never advocate forsake one to the benefit of another. So there has to be a mutually respectful and mutually agreed upon pathway forward. I don't know the legalities. I know I've read it's past environmental challenges and it's a project going forward. Where, where the legalities lie or don't lie, um, I, I am very cognizant and aware of the Native Americans' Indians' plight their proud heritage and the, the sanctimony of sacred land, and that should be respected. Thank and if it's uh, extra cost to go around, or I'm, I'm unaware of those issues. It's not in my district, my territory. Right, I right, paid right. attention to it. I just know that it was and it is an economical way for supply chain of, of, for, of, for, of an energy resource. And I'm in favor of that, more of it. While we build our batteries capacities, while we build our um, energy supply that is not reliable and consistent as Europe learned this last winter that wind and solar isn't the answer for all of it. Germany and, and, and many of Europe learned that uh, very harshly this last winter. Tio Pepe's coffee, food, everything here is good. Thank you.